Okay, I need some audience participation here now. Hands up here, who likes their bank? Hands up here, who uses more than one bank? Okay. Hands up, who uses a crypto bank? Okay. Well, let's find out if crypto really is the future of banking. Please welcome to the stage, in conversation with Bloomberg news reporter Alastair Marsh, the co-founder and CEO of Revolut, Nikolai Storonsky. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Alastair Marsh, reporter with Bloomberg in London, I cover crypto and blockchain. And I'm joined by a gentleman that is probably very well known here, Nikolai Staronsky, who's the co-founder and CEO of Revolut, as we've just heard. Nikolai, I wonder if, uh, I'm, as I say, I guess you're very well known in this room, but for those who don't know you, could you briefly introduce yourself, tell us about Revolut, and tell us how the company got into crypto? Uh, sure. So my name is Nick. Uh, I'm founder and CEO of a company called Revolut. So Revolut is effectively a digital bank uh, which provides uh, all financial services uh, the banks provide. And on top of it, we do much more, for example, crypto. So I started it about three years ago. Uh, now we have uh, more than three million customers across Europe. We're opening, uh, t well, eight to 10,000 uh, new accounts a day. Transactional volume is uh, more than uh, three and a half billion dollars a month at the moment, and uh, we are expanding outside of Europe as well. Fantastic. Okay. One, one of the headlines recently around Revolut has been uh, that the company has achieved unicorn status, this kind of mythical and wonderful achievement for a fintech to have a valuation of more than a billion dollars. Can you talk to us a little bit about how much or how significant the crypto business was in achieving that, um, that milestone, and also um, how, what proportion of kind of future revenue and profits you expect to come from your involvement in the crypto space? Uh, sure. So we, we launched uh, crypto uh, December last year. So it's about 10 months ago. And uh, I mean, it was great, right? So there, there was a lot of demand, a lot of volume coming through the platform. Uh, so this year it's uh, much less, right? Due to hype, you know, coming off. Uh, overall, we still kind of, you know, produce quite a good volumes, but they are 20, 30 percent uh, compared to the level it was before in December. In terms of revenues, uh, I mean, it's not that significant for us. So it's less than 10 percent of revenues comes from uh, crypto business. And in terms of valuation, I mean, my, my experience with investors was, uh, I mean, at least when we raised money, they, they didn't really care about, about this business. Uh, right. Because we, we effectively position ourselves as a bank, not as a crypto business. Yeah. I see. Okay. Fine. Well, one criticism about the offering that you have in crypto, and I wondered if you could maybe talk a little bit about, about this, is that it was structured so that you couldn't do wallet to wallet transfers, i.e. if you had a Bitcoin in your Revolut account and you wanted to uh, monetize that, you, you couldn't transfer it out. You had to convert to fiat and then and then take it out. Could you explain a little bit why it was structured that way? Would you change it? What was the thinking behind that, please? I mean, the reality, because we partner with uh, many banks, we partner with uh, Reason and MasterCard as well, uh, and they simply didn't allow us, right? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> so we, we fought it uh, very hard about it. But the reality, we lost, right? And then as a result, you can only buy and sell crypto within our account. Uh, you can't uh, load crypto, you can't withdraw. So right now we're trying to effectively make a business case where we allow people to withdraw crypto to other crypto wallets. And if we win it, then the you know, next uh, logical step will be to allow people to load crypto. And then the reason why banks and you know, schemes are afraid of uh, uh, loading crypto is obviously uh, they're old fashioned, right? Very risk averse. Uh, and their compliance people don't know technology, right? As a result, uh, they don't know what tools to exist to, for example, to do suspicious uh, transaction monitoring um, on crypto nodes. And they just, you know, tell, you know what, you, you can't do it. That's it. Okay. Another milestone or another kind of 
big news point around Revolut is the application for a banking license and moving towards a bank, which you just mentioned. Can you talk a little bit about the progress with regard to that? And, mm. and will having that license allow for a differentiated crypto offering from what you've just said? And obviously you said that uh, the existing partners perhaps complicated what you may have wanted to achieve. Will having your own banking license get over those hurdles, do you think? Uh, yeah, so the reason uh, behind decision making to apply for banking license was uh, we want to be as independent as possible, right? And uh, just uh, being e money institution, uh, we still rely on banks. So we wanted to kind of, you know, have a bit more independence. So we applied for banking license and then we looked uh, across the whole Europe where we want to apply, right? And then we looked at, I don't know, UK, Germany, uh, Luxembourg. And then the process was uh, two years to get a license which from my point of view is just you know, ridiculously long. And then we uh, uh, chosen uh, Lithuania uh, because uh, their process seemed to be you know, faster. It was only like you know, 12 months. And they were also pushing into FinTech territory by being you know, extremely uh, FinTech friendly. So we were one of the first companies who applied for banking license in Lithuania. And I think you know, 10 or 20 you know, uh, companies uh, from, from UK uh, followed us as well. So we expect to get it uh, hopefully by the end of this year. Right. I've asked you a lot about the company thus far, just to step back a bit and to, I guess, to get to the point of today's discussion, which is about crypto and banking. Do, do you think, or could you share your thoughts about what a crypto bank might look like or a bank mm. where sort of blockchain technology and crypto economics are a key variable and how it's, how it's structured and how it runs? I mean, the way I personally see opportunity is actually in the B2B business, right? So I don't know what, whether like, uh, you, you are aware how like you know corresponding banking works. Uh, reality is uh, in each country we've got like you know 10, 20, 30 banks, right? And then uh, whenever they do uh, international payments, they need to set up uh, themselves accounts in, uh, in 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 other banks outside of their country, right? As a result, we have this uh, huge uh, corresponding network of bank having a bank account in another bank, having an account in another bank. It can be like you know 10 banks in a chain. Uh, so basically, the huge opportunity now is to uh, create effectively a, uh, a digital currency, right, which is pegged to dollar, to euro, to pound, and so on. And as a, as a result, uh, you can effectively create a, a centralized issuer, like central bank, and then all our other organizations, they can, you know, send or receive uh, money uh, through blockchain without actually setting up corresponding banking. So I think that's uh, a big thing that can be done, you know, using using blockchain. I think someone uh, sooner or later will uh, will get it done. Okay. So do, do you foresee a time when banks may create or use may, may create their own stable coins or use them in use yeah, them in some way? Yeah, hundred percent. will happen because it's it's just cheaper and uh, more more convenient. I see. Okay. W working for Bloomberg, I'm very interested in what we might describe the institutionalization of crypto, in particular the movement of kind of big finance, whether that be banks or hedge funds, asset managers into the crypto space. And I've been tracking or trying to keep a track of what the big banks are doing. And whilst we hear various things about custody and market making and various sort of synthetic derivatives that various banks are working on, it does seem at this point that there's a lot of noise, but not really that much uh, kind of concrete action or not, not that many things that you could point to to really demonstrate that the banks are that heavily involved in crypto at this point beyond talking. What's your thinking on that? Do, do you agree with how I've just described it? And what are the, what are the key impediments for a, a big banks getting involved in this space? Well, I agree. Uh, banks usually talk, but don't do. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I agree with it. Uh, so we see a lot of you know, uh, talk about you know, crypto. Some, uh, some banks uh, start creating uh, trading desks uh, in cryptocurrency. But reality so far, last uh, eight, nine months, I just don't think it, it really moved uh, much. Right, okay. Yeah. And it seems a lot of the offerings or a lot of things that are being discussed are kind of all arm's length. So you, you have like a Goldman Sachs NDF and you have Morgan Stanley talking about swaps and you have various other things, but it doesn't seem that anyone is actually trading or uh, getting involved in the underlying markets. It's always a step removed. Is that just simply a function of kind of regulatory worries or is there something bigger behind that? I think banks are very good uh, at following their uh, big clients, right? Uh, so like, you know, Goldman Sachs, obviously they, they, they serve uh, big institutional investors and uh, you know, big hedge funds. So unless these uh, big institutional investors and hedge funds move heavily in crypto world, I just don't think, you know, uh, banks will move because they simply try to make money, right, from, from their clients. If their clients want to, I don't know, swaps on uh, crypto or like, I don't know, some kind of uh, 
uh, borrow crypto to, to sell, uh, then, you know, they, they will move fast. So it seems that, you know, there is no interest from uh, big uh, institutional investors so far. I see. I, I read an article earlier in the year about Morgan Stanley preparing uh, swaps uh, on kind of Bitcoin ETFs, uh, Bitcoin futures, sorry. And the, uh, basically, the, the sources that we had said that the offering was ready to go at any moment. They were just waiting to see if there was any institutional demand, which I guess yeah. speaks to your point. So perhaps it's not just an impediment on the bank side, but also you see perhaps that the institutional investors, the bank's biggest clients are not interested in the space. I mean, Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, has said that not one single customer of his, I don't know whether that's true or not, he has probably many, many customers, but uh, he's said that not one of them wanted to, or has asked BlackRock for crypto business. I mean, yeah, you're forgetting that, you know, all these uh, big institutional uh, uh, funds, they also have compliance department, right? Uh, so this compliance department here is, okay, you know, Bitcoin, swap on Bitcoin, optional Bitcoin, they, 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 they just uh, scared, right? So then you know, nothing happens. So how do we get over this hurdle? Is it the FCA or the SEC needs to come out and kind of give a rubber stamp to some, uh, in some way, shape or form to certain types of crypto activity or are there other underlying factors at play? I think it's just a question of time, right? Because uh, usually people are afraid uh, of uh, anything new. Uh, compliance people are afraid squared, right? Uh, so. Uh, yeah, just a question of time when, you know, community becomes, you know, more familiar with instruments and then hopefully there will be, you know, some more demand and then, you know, banks will follow. Okay. Okay. You've worked for a big bank or a few, you've worked for Credit Suisse. Yeah. Do, you, do you see a time when the, the big names in kind of established finance, the Credit Suisse or the Goldman or the JP Morgan, when those guys are really the big names in crypto? I mean, they're not, they are big names, but they're not big names in crypto now. Uh, I don't know, difficult to say. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, my bet would be that fintechs will be very big in uh, crypto, right? Uh, for the foreseeable future. I just don't think banks will catch up. Right, okay. Perhaps, I mean, it, one, one thing that's very interesting to me is that um, if you look at the ETF market and how that has evolved, actually you have a lot of kind of smaller market makers or smaller in terms of size compared to the banks who actually really control the trading of ETFs or in a big way. Perhaps, and it actually it seems that there are similar things happening in, in the crypto market. Do you think that it will be that, you know, there will be other key kind of market participants like, like the kind of high frequency trading shops then that have a bigger role to play in crypto than the banks? Is that how things will evolve, do you think? Yeah, I think there is definitely an opportunity for high frequency firms uh, in crypto space. I remember when we launched crypto, it was just mad. I was looking at uh, different arbitrage opportunities between different exchanges. I mean, you can right. make like, you know, five, five percent on the trade, right? And then, you know, and because all uh, effectively startups and fintechs in uh, crypto trading, they are amateur, so they don't really kind of, you know, know how uh, financial world works. Uh, so the result market uh, was very inefficient. I guess you know it's still very inefficient. So I think if uh, professionals from uh, hedge funds or high-frequency trading firms come in and uh, particularly target this market, uh, so initially they can make a lot of money on it. Okay. A lot of the discussion that we've had thus far is about banks kind of creating new uh, businesses for crypto, whether it be marking making or custody or what have you. But kind of banks' bread and butter is is lending and sort of de deposits. And well, actually, one, one way potentially that they could get involved in the crypto space is to bank crypto businesses like exchanges or brokerages. But that's actually proved to be very, and certainly in some cases, uh, controversial and it's not really happening. Do you think that, that that kind of lending and banking could be a sort of a simple bridge between um, kind of not, well, a simple first step into the space for established banks? Uh, so you're asking about whether they would, uh, apart from lending, be involved in, uh, for example, I don't know, deposit in crypto? Well, whether, whether yeah. it would make sense for a established bank to provide an account or loans to crypto businesses? Uh, of course it makes sense, right? But I mean, uh, if, if you're a crypto business and then you, know, you try to open a bank account, I mean, forget about it, right? So like, they, they, they will not open it for you. So then you will need to probably try to open a bank account with uh, smaller banks. Right. Uh, but generally, like crypto business is considered extremely high risk business by uh, compliance in banks. And uh, in 99% of the banks, uh, they, they, they just simply like, you know, don't take application. Right. Uh, but I think, you know, there is a big opportunity for, for banks actually to, to serve these clients. They just need to learn how to do it.
They may be high risk, but some of them are also highly profitable too. If you look at some yeah, of the exactly. exchanges, I mean, exactly, yeah. Okay, you think that the, what what would it take to kind of turn the dial? Is it just uh, risk and compliance getting more comfortable with the idea of, of crypto, or um, is it does it come again back to regulation? Uh, I think it's uh, purely a risk reward function, right? So if I'm a bank, right, and then you know. I, a client is uh, risky, right? So cryptocurrency exchange can go bust, right? You, you can have, you know, potentially big PR, uh, big PR, negative PR about it. So just charge more money, right? <laughs> so that's, that's what I would do. But uh, for some reason, banks just prefer not to serve these clients. Okay. Yeah. And with, with time sort of drawing to a close on us, I wonder if we could just look ahead to sort of next year. So 2017 was a very dramatic year for the crypto space. 2018 has been a kind of a, a big downer and potentially a kind of weeding out of some of the uh, less fruitful projects, let's call it that. What's your uh, thoughts for kind of 2019 in, in crypto? Are we kind of another rally or, kind of, or is it just building on sort of con the constructive stuff that's happened this year? Well, what, what do you think as we look forward? I think usually uh, every new thing goes through ups and downs, right? And usually we see like, you know, uh, double dips. So I think you know next year there, there, there might be something exciting appearing uh, for like you know everyday usage because the reality is uh, for majority of uh, well at least our customer script is still like you know speculative tool. Right. Um, there is a uh, opportunities now in B2B, right? Maybe we'll see in 2019 some opportunities in uh, B2C. So some are real real use cases. Okay. So a constructive year, but not a very exciting year, perhaps. Well, we'll see. We'll see, okay. Yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Nikolai Stromansky, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you.